Hey everyone, Pete here from Rugged Outdoors Guide, and I'm glad to have you along with us today. Hey, last video I did last week was about how to make your own do-it-yourself canoe carry yoke for a solo canoe. And this week, what we're talking about is how to put these guys on, how to make your own pads, your own uh, yoke pads. Now, you can buy these for, you know, anywhere from like, 50 to over 100 bucks for a good set of yoke pads and I've made these for a fraction of that amount. The bad news is that I kind of put it together to make sure I knew what I was doing and I realized uh, kind of when it was on the edge of being too late that I had to glue these, um, the actual pads themselves to the, to the um, sort of the rigid backing for the pads with an epoxy and once I did that, I can't really redo it to show you. So what I'm gonna do is just uh, take some cutaways and some close-ups and I'm gonna explain how to do it and it'll be hopefully a pretty short video. <laughs> hopefully, I'm bad with long videos, really. All right, so what I'm gonna do is explain to you what you need to buy to get started. And uh, the whole, my whole shopping list basically cost me around 15, 16 bucks. I was hoping to do it for even cheaper than that, but that's Canadian, by the way. So that's like $1.50 US or something crazy like that. Just kidding, but anyway. So what you need to start off with are two tie plates. Tie plates are just meant to tie, basically bind two pieces of wood together, like a couple of two by fours to extend them. Um, so pretty simple concept. Um, you're looking at two flat tie plates, minimum size of eight by three inches in dimensions, and you're looking at about one sixteenth of an inch thick. Now you can get them thinner and you can get them thicker, but if you're if they're thinner, you can kind of tell when you're um, you know if you're if you're going to Home Depot or something, you can kind of tell they're just flimsy. And for sitting on your shoulders for a long period of time, uh, they're just not going to hold their shape. If you get any thicker than about a sixteenth of an inch, you're looking at something that you won't be able to bend and shape very well for yoke pads. So that's kind of what I came up with, um, a sixteenth of an inch. Then you're gonna need two wood spacers. And that's these little pieces in here that separate actually the pads themselves from the yoke. And that's not necessary, that's optional, but I wanna create as much height between the yoke pad on my shoulders and the canoe, because I got nap, you know, like backpacks and things like that, and so I just don't like my food barrel banging against my seat when I'm carrying the canoe, and so I, I find that if I can separate it even, even more than this would be good, but I would say just so that it's not bulky and awkward, keep it to maybe, um, you know, an inch thick, maybe an inch tall. So the next thing you need is four two inch hex head bolts, uh, about a half an inch thread. Um, they are, that's probably uh, the right size. You're gonna need um, two in each one uh, to connect them. You can't use one because they'll swivel and that's not really a good thing. So I have two and anything, you can do a bit smaller, the size smaller uh, in terms of the thickness of it. Yeah, uh, whatever, it doesn't really cost much difference and uh, I would just stick with, with this size, the uh, two inch long, half inch thread uh, bolts. The next thing you need is four, four prong T-nuts. And these are located right here on the back uh, of the yoke and it's actually the, the side that's facing the, the canoe when it's on your shoulder. So it sits like this and what you need these for is for the bolts to actually screw in. You don't wanna have the bolts coming right out and then a nut on there. It's just more stuff to, to catch on to stuff and drag and maybe even rip something important. So I would suggest that you use the T-bolts or T-nuts for um, you know the, the receptacle. Instead of a nut, you want a, a, a T-nut to um, uh, be kind of flush against the wood. So it's just a way better deal than having a regular nut and the bolt sticking way up out of it. Okay, and there are two final things that you're gonna need, and that would be the actual padding that goes on to these uh, tie plates once they're bent in, in shape, 
and uh, it, it kind of looks like this. This is, a, uh, this is just a leftover piece. It's just a kind of high density foam. It's not super high density so that you can't even press it in, but it's not a piece of foam like you would have in a sponge, for example. This is dense. This actually repels water. If you put it in water, it'll pop right back up and uh, it doesn't absorb water at all if that's what you want. And um, I can press really hard, pinch as hard as I can with my fingers and it's still offering lots of padding. So wherever you can get that, I'll, I'll try to put some links below on where I can direct you to where you can get some of this. It comes in different colors and styles and uh, they feel a little bit different one from another, but whatever, there's all kinds out there and I will direct you to where you can get your own. And that's what's gonna go right in in here against your shoulders uh, inside the the wood or the uh, metal tie plates that have been bent into shape. And the last thing you're going to need is some epoxy. Now I used JB Weld Marine Epoxy, but I'm pretty sure a lot of other ep epoxies will work. Uh, it's just commonly and widely available and it's not too expensive, so it works wonderfully. So an epoxy is probably what you want rather than um, contact cement or, or any other type of glue that I can even think of. So you're going to need this to stay on through all sorts of environmental condition, um, conditions. So you'll want, you'll want the best stuff you can get, the best glue. I don't know, it might even work to do um, you know, PL Premium. I don't know, construction adhesive, I haven't tried it. That might work as well. If you have some kicking around, it might not be uh, a bad thing to try. In fact, I know that dry PL Premium feels exactly the same as this dry JB Weld epoxy, marine epoxy. So let's get into exactly how I made these uh, so you can kind of get an idea of how long it takes and what it'll look like. All right, guys, so now I just need to tell you how I found the exact place for these pads on my yoke. There's no science to it, really. All I did was just kind of estimate where I would want them to sit nicely on, uh, you know, about halfway between my neck and the outside of my shoulder, kind of where, you know, if you have somebody good enough to massage your back from behind, where their hands would be, or, you know, when they massage your shoulders, that's kind of where I wanted the pads, right? So all I did was um, do a, I put the, the yoke itself on my shoulders and kind of took a pencil mark and kind of put it where I would kind of like it on each side. And then uh, I, I made sure that those pencil marks were equidistant from the exact center of the yoke, right? So, um, it, you know, it would be really symmetrical. And then I actually got my son to just measure the same distance again between the middle of this, you know, between my neck and my shoulder on one side and the same place on the other side. And then I just kind of put that measurement together with the, the two marks that I had put on the, the yoke itself, which, and they were really close. And so I thought, okay, that's about where the center of my pads are gonna be. And then I actually snuck them out a, a, a tiny, tiny fraction. So they're not exactly centered to my measurements um, because I didn't want the inside of the pad to touch my neck. So uh, anyway, that's really it. You can kind of use your own technique, but that's what I did to find the exact placement of the pads. The other thing is I mentioned earlier about uh, the, the pad itself that you would use inside the um, tie plates for the, the padding. You guys have all seen these, I'm sure. These are uh, those interlocking pads that you put on your floor, you know, like a, a gym floor or maybe a playroom or something like that, really cheap. You usually buy them in stacks of like, you know, uh, half a dozen or a dozen of these things. You don't even need, uh, you know, a quarter of one of these. So um, I don't know if you have them lying around, if you have any extras, they would be a good option or you can you know, spend the amount that it takes to buy a bunch of them and maybe use them for something else. But anyway, they're, they're a little bit um, tougher and um, more sturdy than the pads that I use, but only a little bit. And what I wouldn't mind doing, if I didn't have the pads that I, I just came across the ones that I use just lying around my, my I, I, have, I have everything, I'm kind of a bit of a pack rat, so I've got a lot of junk. I would, this is a really good option if you double it up. I would uh, do two layers of this. You could do one, but two layers is fine. Uh, it, it's, it's no skin off your back. You're gonna have a lot of this material and it's just that much better and it makes the canoe sit a bit higher, plus it's more padded. So it's a win-win all around if you do maybe two layers of these attached to each other with the same epoxy that you attach it to the, the metal tie plate. 
Okay, so here's a close-up of the um, yoke itself and the bench that I was working on most of the time. And you'll recall that I talked about these hold-down clamps in the last video. If you saw, I'm not going to talk about them today. I will just talk about these, the pads themselves. So I took the tie plates and I actually put them into, one at a time, into just a vise, a bench vise. And I used a mallet to kind of just kind of hit them into place, kind of mold them, and then realized I could just do it with my hands. But you gotta be pretty firm about it. You can't, uh, you can't, you can't be gentle at all because you'll need some real power to uh, mold these. And, and the problem is that they're not gonna be uh, perfectly curved. There's gonna be a little tiny bit of an extra kink where you have it in the vice unless you're you know you, you really finesse it but that's really what you're going to have because they are fairly tough and you you kind of got to give them um you know a, a real cranking and they're going to bend at a particular point more than the rest of it but it doesn't really matter in the end so once i finished uh shaping the tie plates then i acquired these two one inch risers that would go under between the tie plate and the yoke and uh, that was just they were just leftover pieces from my the yoke that I cut originally when I cut it down and uh, so they worked perfectly and then I just basically made a hole straight through both the tie I made two holes you can see them right here it's kind of dark I don't know if you can see them there there's two holes that I drilled and you can see them through the padding because I had to make the holes in the padding to access the, the bolt heads, the hex heads. But I drilled two holes in the, the tie plates right through the spacer and then through the yoke itself. And then you can see on the back, I put the two T-nuts in. And in this case, because this is hardwood, the T-nuts normally, if it was softwood, you can just sort of smack them in. Make a, a pilot hole, a hole big enough for the T-nut uh, bottom to fit in. And then you just use a hammer and smash them in. The problem is that uh, with hardwood, it's really difficult and it can cause it to split. And so what I did was I actually made little tiny holes with an awl uh, where the T-nut T uh, prongs would go in. So you'll figure that out. If you don't know what I mean, you'll figure it out when you start doing it. So it was not a hard thing to do. So anyways, I was able to put two of those there and two on the other side here. And um, once the T-nuts were in, it was just simple as, as putting uh, the matter of putting the, the bolts right through. So what I did then is just before I put the bolts through and permanently attached it, I, I put the, 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 the padding, the foam padding inside the tie plate and made an impression on the one side that I pushed against here, I made an impression of where the, the bolt heads were going to be. You could see them, they impressed into the foam. And then I just cut out in a sort of a, kind of a haphazard way actually, uh, two, two holes inside the padding itself, right where the, the heads were gonna be because I need to have access to those you know, to take them on and off and, and to adjust them. If they get loose, I need to tighten them. So, um, so I made the holes and then once it, once I, I kind of lined everything up and that's when I glued it together. So that's kind of the process. The last thing I did was glue it together. And then once I finished gluing it together, I used any, any sort of clamp. I used a clamp kind of like this to clamp the two sides like I just clamped here and here but I had a piece of wood kind of like this one and I put it here and I clamped it here and then I did the same up top here so two places so in it for each pad so four in all uh, clamps and pieces of wood so that just held it in place while the glue was drying overnight and behold that is the result so um, it's, it's in one sense, it's not super pretty because you've got these holes in the padding, which, well, you know, ideally I wouldn't want there. I'd want it just to have the nice padding. And then if you look carefully, you can see along here, there's a ridge of a sort of, uh, um, uh, I don't know if I want to call it a kink or a ridge. And there's another one 
on this side, right along here, simply because that's how the best I could do in a vise. Um, by bending it, you know, putting it in the vise and, and kind of shoving it over. But it really didn't make any difference in the end. The, the padding glued on quite nicely. So that is really it. I did that times two. It took me about, uh, well, all total, the work itself was probably about an hour, though I had to wait overnight for the glue to dry. And that's the final result. And don't forget, if you want to be nice to me, give me a like and a subscribe and comment down below. Tell me if you've made one of these yourself or if you have some tips that uh, might help other people who are looking to do the same thing. Please do give me a comment below. And right now, the only thing we have left to do is to try this out. I've never done that. This is the first time. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, pure luxury. My shoulders, I feel like I'm being massaged. It's awesome. Whoa, but it's really windy. Ah! <laughs> All right, guys. Remember, until the next time, get out there, enjoy God's creation, and keep on looking up. I just want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Soul in Soul. And when I say sponsor, I mean they just sent me this very cool pair of biomechanically correct gel shoe inserts and they didn't pay me any money which means i'm free to tell you what i really think of these because they don't own me Ow. okay guys seriously all joking aside sole in sole adhesive inserts actually are really really comfortable they fit any shoe because they're small it actually helps correct your gait that is the way your foot is shaped when you walk. Like, you know, if your ankle kind of rolls to the inside a bit and your knees kind of come together, if that's kind of how you walk, that's called pronation. And it really helps for that. It helps to, to correct that over time. The greatest thing of all about these things is that they have regenerative adhesive. Does that mean they're alive? So guys, like you, I have seen insoles for sale everywhere, forever. You might ask, well, then what makes these so much different? Well, I'm glad you asked. So here is what makes these gel sole insoles unique. They're designed to give relief and comfort from plantar fasciitis and heel pain. It helps prevent overpronation while giving your foot the proper gait. They reduce stress on your ankles, knees, hips, and your spine. They're made of specialized adhesive memory gel. They're high elasticity, anti-shock, and odorless. They're soft, flexible, and smooth. It sticks firmly in place, but it's meant to be transferred to other shoes pretty easily. That is awesome. And best of all, they have a super long life expectancy. They're washable and reusable. You just gotta like, run water over them after they're really kind of junked up with lint and all the other junk that comes in your shoes and they're like new. Yeah, I've been wearing these things for a while now because I go on lots of hikes and I like them on my portages as well. I just want to have every advantage I can have when I'm doing all those activities and these just feel really nice in my shoes and they don't take up extra space you know how some insoles you put them in a perfectly good pair of shoes and all of a sudden the shoes are too tight doesn't happen with these but they do the same thing so what kind of shoes can you use these for dress shoes boots of any kind basketball shoes bowling shoes of course your hikers very cool cross-country running shoes I'm really not sure what this is and here's the best thing. You can stick them into open-toed sandals or flip-flops like this, and you kind of feel like they've been there the whole time. You can take them out, wash them, stick them in another pair of shoes. I mean, that stuff sounds like it's from the future. Okay, make sure you check them out online, soulinsoul.com. When you go there, make sure you use the promo code PETEISAWESOME. You get 95% off. No. I'm kidding, but everything else I've said is right.